let us continue the modern climate change where we have looked at the forcing and now we are looking at various impacts that have been manifested. So, when we go to future climate change, we will be more specific about defining attribution, but we have already said something about detection and attribution. So, this was the change in snow melt in the spring and runoff and how it has become more extreme and I said this affects the ecosystems that live typically at the mouth of the rivers in the estuaries and so on. We will extend that to looking at more about impacts on uh, vegetation and ecosystems. And as I already mentioned, the decorrelation scales of temperature are large and it is e easier to simulate them with the models and capture their variability. So, with that in mind, the number of freeze days have been decreasing, which is more easily measured and it turns out also is more easily simulated. We will come to that when we start doing projections. And the day of first freeze is coming later. So, these are days of the year and basically that means the days are remaining warmer as we approach the winter, which is much more important for either higher altitudes like in the Himalayas or higher uh, latitudes uh, as you go into colder uh, climates with stronger seasonal cycle. And the day of the first freeze is also arriving later. So, these are important for many reasons. For example, they would kill the mosquitoes. They will also kill the insects which are pests for crops uh, and many other related ecosystem uh, responses. So, uh, you can imagine take these two together. The freeze periods, the number of days over which the frost happens or temperatures drop below 0 typically during night times is dropping. But there is some good news to begin with where the growing season is actually getting longer in terms of number of days per year. So, this we are looking from 1960s onwards, which is essentially means the warm temperatures are favorable for crop growths, vegetation growths and so on. The photo period does not change, which means the length of day is not really changing, but within the day the hours with warmer temperatures uh, are increasing and hours with uh, frost temperatures are decreasing. There is some research that shows that this is not going to be good news all the way because beyond a certain temperature, the photosynthesis is not optimal anymore. So, the crop yields will begin to decrease and we will see some of that in this lecture as well. So, here is the classification of pretty detailed classification of the vegetation types going from forest uh, systems in the tropics, which are essentially the rainforests. There are degraded forests and croplands, boreal systems, which are high latitude forests, high density urban agglomerates. So, you know where the cities are, irrigated cropping systems, extensive cropping systems. So, there is slightly different terminology there, pastoral systems, where you have lots of grazing. So, enough vegetation to maintain cattle and livestock and sheep and so on. Irrigated cropping systems that are different than rice just because of the way the flooding is done and the evaporative loss and so on. So, in general irrigation is considered very inefficient. So, almost 60 percent or maybe more gets evaporated as the water is just spread and especially during hot summer days and a lot of evaporative loss happens. So, it is an inefficient system. Intensive cropping systems where you have multiple crops being rotated and aiming for high yields and so on and so forth and there are barren lands. You need to figure out as the temperatures are warming, precipitations are shifting, the Hadley cell may be expanding, uh, higher latitudes are warming faster because of the so called polar amplification that we talked about. Then how is each climate system responding and whether that is really bad news for everybody? That is always kind of the key question. So, this is showing the growing season length in days. As you can imagine, the growing season is pretty long in regions where you have rainforest, Amazon and the Central African regions. 
where you have very strong seasonal rainfall like the monsoons even though you are in the tropics you have shorter growing season even though we have two crops the growing season is still not 360 days even though with irrigation often we are growing something all the time as we transition from rainforests into thinner forests into tundra and then into the desert you can see the growing season drops at higher latitudes where you have very strong seasons obviously growing seasons are uh, shorter and so on and so forth that's what you are always trying to look at how they have been changing there are many ways to do it so the way i like to show is this one which is called human appropriation of net primary productivity or production so how much photosynthesis there is whether it's in wild plants and forests or agricultural systems and it can be done through harvesting which is the agricultural system or any fruits and berries and leaves and other things we take directly from uh, vegetation that's not managed and land use change which could be deforestation urbanization and so on and so forth they are all measured in gigatons of carbon per year which is one of our favorite units and the red line here is basically in terms of the percentage change in human appropriation of primary production so you can see that in almost all continents the human appropriation has gone up from the beginning of the 20th century into the 21st century both the harvested type and the land use type harvested types are more where you have very intense agriculture and this is just split into various western industrial regions former soviet union and eastern europe asia africa and latin america so the main message is that human beings have been appropriating more and more of the primary production as time goes obviously this has a lot to do with uh population growth also to do with the way we consume number of calories how we get it and uh it turns out that the food wastage also has gone up with modern times as we eat more outside in the restaurants lots of food gets wasted uh, and so on and so forth okay so that's the the main message how is it interacting with the physical climate changes so we go back to uh, some of the measures of what matters we looked at the number of freeze days and uh, length of growing season and so on this is showing something called the palmer drought severity index which is a simple model that does water balance by using temperature precipitation and essentially is a normalized scale that goes from plus 10 to minus 10 minus 10 is very dry plus 10 is very wet so when you see regions here that are positive that means over time they are getting so over the 20th century into 21st century they are getting wetter and obviously there is a lot of bad news there are lots of regions which are getting drier so essentially this is done with a time variability and a spatial pattern we won't go into the details of how statistically this is done but essentially at any given point you can take at any time the value here and multiply it and you will get what the change was at the time so if it is negative here and positive here that means during the 20s and 40s there was actually some wetter climate here and over time they have gotten drier and this was drier and then it has gotten wetter as this has changed sign so you have to get used to creating the change at each location by multiplying the spatial value with the temporal value nonetheless considering all these are positive during the last several decades and there are large regions with positive values here especially for poor countries in africa and asia it means that drought severity has been increasing okay so despite the irrigation and there is a separate question about whether how irrigation itself affects climate irrigation in the bread basket of india northwest punjab haryana region is for example in on such a large scale so much water is put on the ground 
and how it interacts when there is less monsoon or more monsoon. There are separate studies that show that despite the monsoon, the irrigation goes on and it actually affects the monsoon itself. We won't get into that, but human activities, as you can imagine, begin to interact with climate change on uh, many uh, time scales and spatial scales. Obviously, w water is part of every crisis you can think of, socio-economic, political and climate change crisis. So it's very common to see pictures like this where people are crowded around water sources. Lots of calculations are made. You can find infinite amount of information on the web. This one is from the United Nations Environmental Project, a little bit old, but you can see that in 1995, the number of places which had water stress in terms of water withdrawal as a percentage of total that is available. So there are very high extractions in the desert regions. This region tends to be called Middle East and North Africa or MENA, which has very less rain, population is growing, all kinds of political instabilities and lot of extraction and of course rich countries like Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and so on um, dig pretty deep to get water, they also desalinate uh, and so on. But nonetheless, uh, compared to the amount that is available, they are exploiting quite a bit more. India is also a hot spot for groundwater mining and there are more detailed pictures from satellites that show that Northwest is losing something like 5 meters per year. So you have to think about how much rain there is, how much that can recharge the groundwater and how much we are extracting. That's how these things are, uh, are done. So we haven't started any projections yet, but this one is a figure that has projections. Obviously, bad news continues for these regions and the water stress expands into all the regions, even the rich western countries, China as it grows all the way into Alaska as warming and permafrost thawing begin to take hold, other growing economies like South Africa and so on. So these are things to be kept in mind. The physical and economic scarcity, so water is always about quantity, how much water there is and how much it rains, quality, how clean it is uh, or whether it's drinkable, arsenic sometimes, fluoride, uh, other things or economic water scarcity which is access. So qu quantity, quality and access. Are you rich enough to get access to water? Uh, so you can see that India for example has large regions of physical water scarcity in the interior peninsular. So coast uh, of west coast of India gets a lot of rain. Once the uh, monsoon winds climb over the western ghats to the other side, there is much less rain. It's in the rain shadow side of the mountains and those have severe physical water scarcity. But there is also regions which are the especially the so-called Gangetic Plain or Ganga Plain has lots of economic water scarcity. So there are projections to see how this will get worse and that relies on uh, projecting future populations, uh, what are the other technologies that will evolve and so on. But it just emphasizes the fact that the solutions that uh, emerge here and there like filters for removing arsenic or softening the hard water, biotechnology approaches uh, and so on will become more and more critical. And the other thing that I will start mentioning now that we will come back to later is how do you deal with the problems of your neighbors? If there are huge problems of water with your neighbor where you have water sharing agreements or maybe you don't, what internal conflicts in those neighboring countries will mean for you and your national security, immigration and so on. So the famous example played out in southern Sudan, Darfur region and so on. The Syrian war is related to water scarcity and so on. So in a globally connected economy, we will see a couple of other examples of a typhoon hitting one place, uh, affecting the supply chain over the whole world. Climate change is not just a local problem anymore. It is very much a problem that requires lots of local solutions, but you also have to keep in mind what is happening around the world, where from where you might get food and energy or in your neighborhood where instability can mean bad news for you and so on. Again, 
we must always keep in mind the internal variability as well when, as we look at the impact on physical climate, ecosystems, marine ecosystems, heat waves on land and the ocean and so on. And I will just mention something that we didn't explicitly say before in terms of the impacts, but we did say that as the warm pool moves and the rainfall moves to the east, we said there will be drought and forest fires on this side, floods and mudslides and so on on this side. And I said it also has global impacts. So you can see that El Nino, which peaks in December, January, February, in the sense the warmest temperatures in the east happen in this season, but it grows during the uh, whole year. So you can see, we will not show the summer teleconnections. These are called teleconnections because you make changes here and climate is being affected here. So teleconnections like telepathy, okay? So these are warm episode relations and these are cold episode relations. There is a similar picture for summer as we know that the summer monsoon over India, for example, gets affected by the El Nino. So during the winter months, you have dry and warm region here, wet and cooler region here, warming and wet, dry and warm, and so on and so forth. So again, going back to the things we mentioned before, if we have a decade with lots of El Ninos, strong El Ninos like the 80s and 90s, El Nino begins to impact the droughts that may be happening or the wetting that may be happening because of global warming. So this superposition should always be kept in, in mind. So this is the example of the dust storm over Melbourne. In fact, data even shows that in Melbourne, uh, when El Nino comes, beer consumption is much higher because it's very hot and dry. This is the forest fires in Indonesia. There are complications there. When we do future climate change, we'll have to worry a little bit about human behavior, for example. In this context, the human behavior is a bit complicated because there is lots of palm plantations now for biofuels and there are other complicating factors like clearing the forest for development. So when an El Nino uh, forecast comes, which typically comes six to nine months before the peak El Nino, so it comes in March, April of this year, uh, if the El Nino is going to happen in December, January, February of this year to next year, then sm some smart developers have started using the El Nino forecasts to apparently start their own fires, to clear up the forest saying that's caused by El Nino. So making a climate forecast may be important, but who uses that information to do what? It, it cannot be easily controlled. That becomes part of uh, the human system when we also begin to make climate projections. So typically we say weather predictions, climate predictions, they are short time scale few days to months to years, whereas when we say projection, that is going into tens of years up to 100 years or longer. This is the satellite image of all the forest fires in South Asia during 2015, which was a very strong El Nino. So this interaction always has to be kept in mind. This is showing much more of wider impact of El Nino, including the ocean regions. So we looked at these already a little bit summer monsoon impacts, but there are coral bleachings happening during El Nino. There are forest fires in various places. There are dust storms, droughts, and there is also ocean heating. So in this region, go back to your basic understanding. If trade winds create upwelling and during an El Nino, the trade winds are weakened. That means upwelling is weakened. We mentioned that that changes the dynamics carbon fluxes, but it also affects photosynthesis, kills lots of fish, and seabirds die, which depend on it, and many fish that can move away do move away, but those which cannot move away will end up dying, and so on and so forth. So the impacts vary from marine life to coastal erosion, coral reef, forest fires, tropical storms, yes. So in this region, hurricanes are reduced during an El Nino, and during a La Nina, hurricanes are increased. It has something to do with how the winds change from the surface to the top because if the wind direction changes very strongly, that tends to shear off the hurricane, take away the energy and make it weaker. If, it is, if the wind change is less, then the hurricane can be 
uh, more favorable to survive can get stronger and so on. So, the wind shear it is called, the wind shear changes with El Nino and La Nina and that affects hurricanes and tropical storms, cyclones and so on. So, floods and droughts of course are also caused by El Nino. Going back to trends that have been observed from 1991 to 2008, again shorter period, but this is the period over which we have very reliable winds over the ocean. So, here we are looking at changes in the 90th percentile, which means the strongest of the winds and 90th percentile in significant wave height. As the winds blow, waves are generated in the ocean. If the winds get stronger, the waves get stronger. So, you can see that much of the world ocean is having increases in 90th percentile of winds with some exceptions here and there. You can see Indian Ocean which is very critical because our monsoon depends on the winds. Associated with that you have some changes in the significant wave heights. So, this is important because if people are trying to find smart ways of putting windmills in the ocean, wind farms in the ocean, this kind of information can help. For example, these coasts here close enough to land. So, can you put offshore wind farms here and extract energy also on this side? Already some states like Virginia and Florida are trying to do that. So, when we come to climate projections, you have to remember that if you invest a billion dollars here and the winds die away in 10 years, then what will happen? So, you have to be aware of how the winds will change in the future, not just how it is changing now. So, India also potentially has offshore wind potential. We will come back to that uh, in the next section. <coughs> the lots of discussions also about climate change and global warming have focused on what is happening to cyclones, hurricanes and so on. So, it turns out that the data is very good for the last 20, 30 years, but as we go back into the 60s and 50s and before, the data on hurricanes and cyclones is not that reliable. So, you cannot always say if the number of hurricanes is increasing with all likelihood the, the evidence we have is that the total number of cyclones is not really changing, but that is not the end of uh, the impact. You can look at things like the power dissipation index, which is a sum of maximum one minute sustained wind speeds to the cube, which at six hourly intervals, which gives you a sense of how much cyclone energy there is at any given point. So, you can see that the maximum storm PDI or power dissipation index has definitely been going up. It has some natural variability as well, which is related to again things like El Nino and PDO and NAO. And SST warming is quite consistent with that. So, the increase in hurricane PDI or power dissipation index is corresponding to the SST increase. Basically, this means that there is some evidence that stronger of the cyclones like category 4 and 5 are increasing and the weaker ones are decreasing. So, the total number of cyclones may remain same, but you will get more of the stronger hurricanes. With the sea level rise, that can be bad news, right? So, even if sea level rise is only increasing by a few centimeters, a stronger hurricane is going to sweep in much more water into coastal regions. So, the coastal inundation and storm surge is going to be much stronger as sea level keeps rising. So, you have to consider these multiple cascading effects that can uh, happen. Let us look at some more of the impacts of CO2 that has been observed. We said that as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, it is highly soluble in water. So, it begins to form carbonic acid. So, CO2 plus H2O gives you carbonic acid. The ocean is a very special system. It has salt in it. It has other kind of uh, minerals in it, which makes it uh, very alkaline. So, you cannot just take uh, fresh water and put salt it into it and make ocean water, because you need alkalinity, which comes from the balance of H plus ion, which is a complicated movement between boric acid and carbonic acid and many other species in the water. So, what is the net effect? 
ocean can take up carbon dioxide, but it does not easily get saturated if it is coming in at a low rate because it dissolves becomes H2CO3. If it remains as H2CO3 or carbonic acid, eventually the ability to take up CO2 would decrease because it would get saturated. But actually in the ocean because of these various balances, the H2CO3 actually splits into H plus and HCO3 minus and then it is called bicarbonate ion. HCO3 minus itself then splits again into H plus and CO3 minus minus which is called the carbonate ion. So, its ability to move stuff from carbonic acid into bicarbonate and carbonate basically makes it continue to take up CO2 and not get saturated. Since it does not get saturated it is called to be it is said to be buffered. So, the ocean is buffered against getting saturated it is called the alkalinity buffer for technical details of how the alkalinity changes because you are changing H plus. The balance of net H plus is of the, is the alkalinity, we will not get into the details, but you can look it up. And so, the question is as you increase CO2 in the atmosphere with uh, fossil fuel burning, will the ability to be buffered against getting saturated continue? Turns out that not so, ocean has remained at a certain pH remember the negative log of H plus is the pH. The pH has remained slightly basic at about 8.2 or so for millions of years, tens of millions of years, but we are increasing CO2 at such a rapid rate that this is not working which means the pH is decreasing which means the ocean is getting acidified because carbonic acid is increasing. Okay, so, that means dissolved C carbon dioxide is increasing and pH is decreasing. So, ocean which has been at this value for many millions tens of millions years since industrial revolution has been getting more acidic. Why do we care? You can already begin to get a hint with by looking at these shell forming things that live in the ocean. So, you begin to have deformed shells. Why? Basically, if it is a animal that is forming calcium carbonate shell CaCO3, if it is to remain without getting dissolved in the surface water, that means the surface water has to be super saturated with calcium carbonate. There is so much calcium carbonate that a calcium carbonate shell does not dissolve. So, it can make a shell out of the calcium carbonate from the water and still not get dissolved. Making the water more acidic basically begins to interact with this calcium carbonate and use up carbonate ion as we will see in the next slide and that is what acidification is. Okay? So, looking at our classic Keeling curve the CO2 has been increasing and along this is looking at one of the stations around Aloha the Hawaii ocean time series. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the seawater is also increasing, more CO2 is dissolving into the ocean water. Remember CO2 is highly soluble in water. Along with that the pH has been decreasing. So, we have a longer term CO2 data than the PCO2 data and the pH data, but nonetheless they are all quite consistent. And of course, if you want to be strict, you have to say that we, we must gather more data before we can say whether this is a trend or just a secular natural variability and so on. Nonetheless, here is where the ocean has been for a long, long time and the ocean chemistry works in such a way that as CO2 is moving in different directions. So, here is the CO2 curve. The HCO3 and CO3 react all together to decide where the pH goes. So, if you increase CO2, then the pH is going to decrease, which is what we call acidification. So, the net reaction of this buffering taken all together is that CO2 dissolves into water 
but if you add up those three reactions that we looked at here, you can write this equation where carbonate ion is taken up as well creating more bicarbonate which means CaCO3 now begins to become less saturated and essentially result in de deformed carbonate shells as I will show uh, in a minute. So, this is the amount of invasion of anthropogenic carbon dioxide into the ocean. There are various ways in which uh, they are estimated. These are measurements from research ships and there are also methods by which you can separate the old carbon that has been in the ocean versus the anthropogenic carbon. And you can see that corresponding to ocean circulation, there are lots, there is lot more carbon going into this because that is an ocean sink, carbon is taken up, deep water formation etcetera. There is less carbon going in here, there is much more carbon going into the southern ocean and the, as we said before, it is key to remember ocean takes up carbon in some places and puts it out in some other places. With global warming, we need to know where it is going and whether it will continue to go into the ocean and what it means. So, it is good news in the sense that carbon dioxide can go into the ocean and, and slow down the global warming because it is removed from the atmosphere where it can act as a greenhouse gas. But the bad news of course is that if it goes into the ocean, it is going to increase the PCO2 in the ocean. These are European waters, Hawaiian waters, Bermuda waters in the Atlantic. Everywhere PCO2 is increasing and pH is decreasing. So, while we may be saved by reduced global warming, creatures that live in the ocean are going to be suffering because of acidification. What is the other major animal that is going to suffer from acidification? Corals of course, corals build their skeleton using calcium carbonate. With acidification, coral is going to have serious trouble. So, these are some of the pictures of the healthy coccolithophorids which form calcium carbonate shell and you can see that with acidification they begin to have all sorts of problems. Okay? So, bad news with increasing CO2, the carbonate ion is going to get consumed, calcium carbonate is going to become less than supersaturated and it begins to deform the calcium carbonate shell forming animals. This is an estimate of the change in pH from 1700s to the present. So, the red numbers are negative which means acidification and you can see that pretty much the entire world is in the negative range and lots of them are in significant acidification range. Not at all good news, right? So, there are some that are less because of the dynamics, the way whether the ocean takes up carbon or not. The, there are issues of how much upwelling happens, how much biology happens or how much PCO2 is brought out and outgassed or taken up and so on and so forth. The net result is that most of the global ocean has significantly acidified as seen by pH changes over the last couple of hundred years. Okay? Let us try to put this together and go through few more things. Remember that these are enormous details. What you want to learn and decide what to teach is how many things are affected by global warming because when we go into projections, picture gets a little bit more complicated because you have to worry about the future and make lots of assumptions of the future. But what is observed, the main issue is always what are we detecting and what is attributable to human activity. So, bad news is bad news. You should collect as much information as possible just to have a baseline. So, from for example, where you are from, there may be no baseline. I will come back to this later on. So, is there any data in your neighborhood to see how the ocean may be changing or how the river may be changing, how vegetation may be changing, how temperature or precipitation may be changing and so on. So, these baselines are important. So, just logging the changes itself is very, very critical. So, this is a very detailed figure, has lots of information. So, do not get intimidated, but just kind of get the big sense. So, it is basically looking at physical systems, biological systems and 
human and managed systems like food production, livelihood, health and economics. And it has got these several bars, so the colors correspond to physical, biological and human systems. And the length of the bars and the whether they are split or solid corresponds to whether our confidence in attributing the change to human activities or to climate change is very low or very high. Okay? So, there is a confidence range associated with it. So, even if you do not remember all the details of confidence change, you can see with your eye that pretty much everything is changing in, in every continent. So, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia and so on. Everywhere you have physical changes, biological changes and human activity changes, not surprising. right? So, that is pretty much how I want to leave it because within the physical system there are glaciers, snow and ice changes, rivers, lakes, floods and droughts, coastal erosion and sea level effects in the ecological systems. You have terrestrial ecosystems, wildfires, marine ecosystems. So, if you for example, Google map of wildfires right now, this is August of 2018, you will see that there are a large number of wildfires everywhere, especially western US. So, there is no fire season anymore. It used to be that summer is wet and photosynthesis happens and the fall things get drier and then lightning or human uh, exceptions uh, create wildfires. But now you have humans are affecting the forest, sometimes making the wildfires worse by managing them and of course, it is getting hotter and drier. So, you are combining various natural human uh, impacts on climate versus human activities to create issues and that is true for uh, fisheries and so on and so forth that uh, we will see. So, this gives you a nice sense of how much data has been gathered in all continents, in all systems to look at how the changes have, have happened. Zooming in more specifically, for example, you are looking here at distribution change in kilometers per decade in various marine species and what is the distribution change? So, essentially you can think of it this way. So, let us say you are in, in the tropics and temperatures begin to warm and expand towards the high latitudes, which of the ecosystems will begin to move? So, for example, we know that mosquitoes are moving further north and you are having diseases, tropical diseases in higher latitudes. So, North America and Europe are having things like chikungunya and dengue and Lyme disease and so on. And they are also going higher in the mountain because of the warming. So, Burkina Faso uh, is in the mountain and mosquitoes are arriving it, uh, which never happened before. But there are also butterflies expanding and so on. And in the ocean you expect along with that some phytoplankton species to move, some fish to move and so on and so forth. So, this is showing the distribution change in kilometers per decade, essentially showing that there are large number of species that are moving by anywhere from 20 to 100 kilometer per decade. That is not a small number. So, if you have a 100 years, that is a lot of movement uh, of lot of species, right? Uh, we saw that the growing season is changing, but that does not mean the yield impacts are always positive. So, if you look at the tropical and temperate regions, yield impacts have been negative. If you look at specific crops like wheat, rice and maize, negative impacts, percent change per decade. Soybean seems to be hanging on, but how long will it hanging on and why is it hanging on? That is also uh, questions that have to be looked at. So, we will continue this. Essentially, we are logging all the changes that are being seen in the different systems and that wherever possible, we are putting confidence limits on what are attributable to climate change and what are the climate changes that can be attributed to fossil fuel burning, greenhouse gas changes or land use change and so on. Okay?